I mean, I taught myself a version of mathematics when I was four or five, which I didn't really understand was a fairly useful, but I couldn't explain it to anyone. So that's one of the reasons why I ended up in the, in the, in the, in the learning difficulties class, because people said you can't count. I was like, well, no, I just invented a new system. It's much better than that. Why would I do that? Hi, I'm Dan Crow, a small business owner living in central Illinois, and you're listening to the Vance Crow Podcast. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm glad you're here. Buckle up. We are in for a wild ride. I have Dr. Lee Cronin on the podcast, who is a chemist that is trying to actually hop the chasm between chemistry and biology. And we have a wild, far-ranging discussion about chemistry, about new ideas, about being the type of person that was put all the way in the uh, learning disabled kids and eventually becoming one of the most renowned scientists that talks to other scientists like Stephen Wolfram and uh, many others on a regular basis. This conversation was a blast. We talk about things like dreams and aspirations and curiosity and novelty search. So while this is a little off of the beaten path from some of the other interviews we did, I want to say a big thank you to Yosha Bach for pointing me in the direction of Lee Cronin. Before we get to that, I want to talk a little bit about the Articulate Ventures Network. Right now, I am uh, able to use the network to beta test some of my classes. You guys that have been longtime listeners of the podcast know that I teach things like negotiations and how to introduce yourself. Well, next month, we are going to be doing a class where I'm working on helping people learn how to talk about your research so that people are interested and engaged and can figure out how your research applies to things that they care about. What we do in the AVN is members get a chance to be a part of the group of five to 10 people that I have in the class that I test out my ideas with. And then before I publish these classes to the broader public, we also get another test run. So people get to see it, play with it, give me feedback. And if you wanna be the type of person that is involved in a network and gets that feedback and helps me produce these classes, give it a shot. And if not, then you can always wait for me to publish the classes publicly and then you can take them for yourself because what we're trying to do is to help people become tangibly better communicators. So if you're interested in joining the Articulate Ventures Network, go to network.articulate.ventures to sign up and become a member that uh, sometimes gets to sit in on classes and have me pressure test your ideas, give you feedback, help you make it better, and then use your work as an example. Or if not, sign up on our newsletter uh, to be able to know when these classes are published for the public. I'm really looking forward to uh, seeing you there. And if you'd like to find out more and sign up for the newsletter, you can go to vancecrow.com slash podcast. All right, without further ado, let's go to this wild and amazing interview with Dr. Lee Cronin. Lee Cronin, welcome to the podcast. It's good to be here. Thanks for the invitation. So you're a curious character. The only thing I really knew about you before I started doing research for this podcast were two things. One, that you are a uh, scientist that is trying to somehow create life from chemistry. And two, you got in a dust up on Twitter that required you to go out and make a public apology, which uh, then brought you to my attention. So these two factors put together made you one of the most ideal candidates for a podcast I could imagine. Twitter is such a horrid platform. Sometimes you can't have a conversation with anyone. It was very funny. Yeah. 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 I mean, I so can tell you about that. Let's start with uh, what your lab does. So you actually run a lab and the way that I would distill it all the way down is you're trying to take chemistry, which is a non-living concept and turn it somehow into biology. Is that a fair representation? Yeah. So the lab, so I'm a, I'm a, I'm a chemist. I mean, I'm, well, I suppose I'm a card carrying chemist. I studied chemistry, but really I've always been interested in um, how the universe works. And I always, took a deep under well wanted to, I want to think deeply about the universe I'm not sure I do um but I the way I do theory is by doing experiments I'm really a theoretician but I try and I try and come up with theory that are very close to the experiments so I like to play with reality so the, the 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 one of the biggest questions I've always had is what is the difference between dead what is the difference between sand and life like you know how do I go from sand to cells or dead dirt to cells so my lab is looking at that in the process of kind of thinking about how that works i had to invent some robotics 
So I've got these drug making robots that I was going to call Heisenberg for fun, but then my group got, you know, said they they got Alexa and say, Alexa, please do this and have Heisenberg, please make. But no, that's that was a joke. But there is a serious <laughs> side because if we can use robots to make drugs that um, humanity needs, or you know, anything, pesticides, on-demand, uh, antibacterial things, things like that could be really important. And so there is the, where does life come from? I needed a robotics for that. I built some robots I realized can make drugs. Then when I realized I could use the robots to do chemistry, I thought, can chemistry be like a computer? So can I use a chemistry set to make a computational system to ask questions? And then the other thing we're doing is asking what the hell it all means is, is there information language in the universe that kind of gets um, brought to life by chemistry in some way and then biology. So I think you have an idea really compressed in your mind that it doesn't quite compute for me. When you say I have robots making drugs, I'm just imagining you saying, you know, mix vial A with my vial B. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a little bit, it's, I'd like to dress it up and make it sound, you know, much more, I don't know, uh, um, uh, Tony Stark, but, but it's not, it's really simple. What we've worked on, chemistry is a very practical subject. You wanna, and I realized this years ago when people were trying to make chemical robots and they were writing out all these equations of chemistry, but I'm like, you put some crap in that pot. Am I allowed to swear? Put some other yeah. crap in the other pot. <laughs> and then, you know, I mean, I did say I was gonna make crack, right? The crack pot, but that was my group again, don't like my humor. So you take some stuff in pot A, you mix it with stuff in pot B, you heat it, then you then purify it, and then you, you go through serious steps. Chemistry is really about cooking. It's like, so the code that we've got, the robotics literally does that, but at a higher level, it can take the reaction and say, oh, if I want to do that reaction, I translate that into um, a recipe that I can understand, and then I then then bring it down to what do I do at the practical level? And that's the trick. That's the leap that we've made that no one thought we could do. The robot practically understands how to mix stuff together to get the reactions to work. This is like at its very core. So I had Jim Rutt, we did a virtual reality podcast on just the other day, and he was talking about how most of the time when people are talking about artificial intelligence, they're really just talking about really quick information processing within a closed system, but not that the that the machine itself discovers something new or comes to a form of consciousness where it can um, take apart something and recompile it in a different format. It sounds like that's what you're describing. That's one element to it. We'd want to get to that. I mean, artificial intelligence is the worst term ever. Basically, I would call it um, not intelligent at all. I would call it something else. I'd just call it basically inferred cur curve fitting. It's like basically, um, oh, I don't know. I, 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 I like using the math. It's basically applied mathematics. That's all it is. It's applied mathematics. Um, but we want to use that applied mathematics to set up the context for doing re looking at what intelligence is. That's the exciting thing. Um, in the chemistry lab, I've always thought that there's something missing, that people want to suddenly um, take a chemistry textbook, do machine learning, like, I don't know, natural language processing, or read it or something, have, you know, Google chemistry, read it, and then say, oh, I can make this drug. But the thing is that the information to make that drug, the data, the intelligence isn't encoded in that book. So all you learn is a load of nonsense. And so what we had to do is say, hang on, let's make a robot that when you give it, um, to say, put vial A and vial B and do these things, it understands that in a hard way. And once we've got, we can make a link between what the robot does and what the chemistry comes out at the other end, then we can start to infer and do discovery. And so what we're doing is, I, I think what we're doing is we're inventing the like the, the, it's like the analog of making the first computer. The first computer needed to be programmed. So people built computers out of transistors and, and, and those were the things they got to work. But what people are doing now with AI, particularly in chemistry and materials and whatever, they're saying, oh, we don't think that we'll just pretend there's a robot and we'll just make stuff up and then we'll come up with a language. And can you read the language? And that's just a that's just a divide by zero. And I rem and I made that mistake myself many years ago, where I made a language, I took it to my group, to my the experts in my team, and said use this language, and they said, and it was kind of the equivalent of me going, you saying, look, I've just learned Klingon, I love Star Trek, you're going to learn Klingon because it's going to be more efficient. You'd be like, 
No, I don't want us featuring Klingon. I'm quite happy using this language. Go away and make Klingon useful to me, and then I will talk. And that's what my lab did. So I then went away and then invented the robot and said, oh, I've got this robot. Would you like it? And they went, oh, that's kind of cool. And I said, now, will you learn Klingon to program it? They went, oh, OK, as long as you can turn the Klingon into English. <laughs> so that's what we, we, we kind of got right now. And how far advanced is your language? Have other people been able to make commits to it and you're, you've allowed it to be open so that it, it can change and evolve itself? So that's a really good point. The language is just about to be made open in the next month or so. It's called KIDL. It's a chemical programming language, but it's so simple and obvious that um, uh, people will be able to uh, use it. And we have got, we're working with maybe four teams around the world in the US, in Canada, in Germany, in Poland, and they're making commits. And what the key thing is, our language isn't just easy to use, but it runs on their robots. So it's a bit like I've made a language that will run on not just the Android, but on the Apple. And that's the killer app, literally to make sure that the, the computer program runs on lots of different platforms. So it's not just my robot now, but any robot that has the right um, um, control system can do the chemistry. And so when you're imagining all of the time you put this, you, you, like something had to drive you to put all this together all of this time, what do you think is going to be discovered as a result of uh, this energy you've put into creating a language and building robots? And I want to discover the origin of life, right? I want to make a new life form. That was my reason for doing it. Um, but I realized, um, I mean, I get into trouble with chemists because the chemists say, you know, I'm being bad to them because I'm, I'm a chemist. I love chemistry, but I do think some chemists are a bit boring because they're just doing routine stuff. And also it's like anything, it's not just chemistry, it's physics does the same, biology does the same. What is it that happens? You get deep specialists who are really good at something and they protect their boundaries and say, oh, you can't do it like this. So when I started and said, I'm gonna make a robot that will do organic chemistry, I went, that's impossible, it's too hard. I'm like, okay, so is organic chemistry magic? They're like, no, no, you don't understand. You're not one of us, you don't really understand, you're not good enough. Okay, well, that's good. I know I'm not good enough. I've not been good enough for a very long time. And then I just say, so when people say, tell me something is not possible, I say, why? If they can't give me a reason why, I just ignore them and do it. Because, so what I expect will be possible is that we will discover new drugs and um, we'll discover new ways of manufacturing chemicals that people need, you know, like, like an Amazon, if you like, right? Rather than having to, um, you know, get the stuff at a, you know, chemical plant, maybe you could make it locally, maybe you could do it in your own house, maybe, maybe you can make personal medicine, maybe if you're, you know, you've got some kind of industry, maybe you want to make cer certain objects for antibacterial use, you will be able to make them like that. This sounds like the dream of 3D printing. And I was one of the people that became uh, hyper convinced that 3D printing within five years was going to just, you know, you'd be able to be on a ship, a tool would break, you could just print it yourself and be just fine. And that future hasn't materialized, but I guess I'm patient enough to imagine a world in which material science becomes much better and you can do that. How long, how, 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 I guess maybe how much excitement do you want people to have about this? Because if they don't have enough excitement, you won't be able to get them to, to learn Klingon oh. in order to build in it. But if they're too excited, then it blows up on the, on the launch pad. Um, oh, it's, it's already been blowing up on the launch pad for the last eight years. <laughs> um, okay, I, I invented it in 2012, I think. And so, but now it works. No, no, no. We, I mean, um, what I can say right now without fear of contradiction is if you wanted a chemical robot um, that you could put in a, in a shack somewhere and get it to make... So what I did for fun is I got, I, how am I going to get people to turn around and like listen, right? So I said to my group, right, we need to make three drugs, one robot, three drugs, three different sets of code. And I said, right, we'll make Nitol, which is a sleeping drug. We'll make Rufinamide, which is anti-seizure med, and we'll make Viagra. <laughs> That's a hard good. Problem. <laughs> That'll yeah, make everybody like, pay really attention. Hard problem. It actually is a <laughs> quite a difficult synthesis because it's kind of toxic and so on. So we made those three things. Sure, the, the robot fails it's an academic robot you know it's like most academics it kind of falls asleep now and then and doesn't understand deadlines and all that <laughs> stuff <laughs> but we but we've made it more and more modular and so now the robot we've got in the lab we've got 12 of them we've started a company um and called chemify so you can go there c-h-e-m-i-f-y dot i-o like spotify so the idea one day is that people will write code like MP3, MP4s, post them, and then you can download the code and run it and make the molecule you want, and it'll work every time. So 
No, it's not, will it happen in five, 10, 20 years, like some things, like maybe people are still waiting for quantum computing. Chemical uh, um, computing or the ChemPU works now. The only barrier is from making it more reliable and convincing people to use it and making the repertoire larger. Man, when I first got involved in the synthetic biology world and I met John Cumbers, who was talking all about like, look, we'll be able to make all of these chemicals from, you know, biology. We'll be able to synthesize it in a way. The very next thing that happened was he had to have the FBI stand up at the SynBio conferences and be like, no, if you see something, say something. But on your level, what you're describing have have the has the ATF knocked on your door and said, like, excuse me, sir, we need to talk about what you're putting out into the world here? Well, I mean, there is a question about that. So we'll come to that. So first of all, synthetic biology, the synthetic biologists are kind of making stuff up. Synthetic biology is not programmable. I can tell you why that is, right? It just doesn't work. I know, John, I've been pushed on him years. It doesn't work. What does work is I can synthesize some DNA and I can put it in a cell and I can do genetic engineering a bit, a bit, but it doesn't really work. That we should kind of annoying. So if I said to you in general, I want to put this gene in this plant, can I do it? You're like, no. You might, if you give me $10 million and a few labs, what I'm saying right now is the chemistry I can get off the shelf right now will work every single time, as long as I've done it once before. Now, should the FBI or the ATF or whoever come to me and say, well, not really, because I'm a chemist and I know how to make molecules. I could go and make those molecules by hand tomorrow and I am making them. I suppose with synthetic biology, the fear is that someone makes a new virus, right? But look, Oh, no, I wouldn't make a joke about COVID because that's actually not very fair. And we are living through some really hard times. Um, I would say that right now I'm not advocating for people making new dangerous molecules. I'm saying all the molecules we know that are out there, we can now make robotically. So if anything, it's more safe because would you want to go and make an explosive by hand if you can make it far away with a robot, you know, kind of in another room? Would you want to make a toxic material that is potential anti-cancer drug, but is also potentially toxic to you if you spill it on you? No, do it in another room. Would you like to make a radioactive label for tracing, you know, for a biomarker to trace, um, what, you know, to image a tumor, um, which doesn't have a lot? So actually, yes, of course, we need to be super careful about the societal implications. But my job is to make sure it works reliably, make sure that we can um, uh, open it up so that more molecules are accessible. And of course, I have ideas how to protect it and to stop people basically joking aside, making crystal meth on demand and things like that. And the question is, how do we enable more drug discovery and worry about, you know, the first world problem, we, there's, there's a, are we all drug abusers? Are we all on drugs? No. Do we all need drugs? Yes. And does the poorest part of the world uh, you know, like is like the bottom billion not got any access to drugs because of this. So we need to put get our priorities straight, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, if I have one fault, it is not clamping down enough. It's the opposite. Like I would rather just let a million flowers bloom and see what happens and then kind of deal with the consequences later. Yeah, I was I just agree. curious if anybody had been <laughs> knocking on. I your agree. Door. I mean, I, I I mean, I think that, you know, if I get to the point where people would be willing to ingest material made in my robots, I would both be horrified and gratified. Horrified because I don't want people to be making illegal drugs, but gratified because I think I might have convinced the FDA or the European uh, Meds or UK Medical Society that this might just save some lives and reduce the, uh, the uh, cost of drugs. So the, right now you make drugs in the plant, the plant works for the pan life, when the pattern is expired, you repurpose the plant. That drug is no longer accessible anymore. My robot makes it like a Kindle ebook reader. No books go out of print. They're all represented as you need on time, every time, perfectly. That's the dream. Then, obviously, you need to do about copyright. Kindles, you want to really worry about copyright. My robot, you're going to worry about people repurposing it and hacking it and making bad things or cool new drugs that we don't want the population to be taking. And they are things we have to deal with. And we're only about to deal with them if we encourage the technology to be developed openly, transparently, and with society saying, hey, what are we doing? Are we, we're still, we'll drink alcohol, but we can't smoke cannabis. Or, you know, you know, I don't know. I mean, I don't have any view. I'm a, I'm a professional uh, chemist. I'm employed by Glasgow University. Um, I, I abide the law of the country that I'm in and, uh, and my aspirations are to 
make people better and and kind of have fun and you know discover if, if aliens exist uh, the drug laws are beyond me <laughs> So that's interesting. So you've just described it. I want to discover if aliens are, exist. And you mentioned before about creating life, and that's your goal. Let's explore that a little bit, because um, one of the challenges with saying I want to create life is the the problem of definition, right? You, as, If you want to say I want to create life, then you have to define what life is. But as soon as you start defining it, then you start already building the thing that you're trying to define when you have something as complex as life. So how do you think about what is living and what is it that you're, when will you know it is that you've been successful? <laughs> yeah, that's really the important question about def definition is a real problem. And so I will take a step back. In fact, I'm not going to define it. And so, well, and the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to, how do you let's take a second. Let's define flight. Let's be before the Wright brothers or before the Mongolfia uh, were they brothers as well? There's all these brothers flying, right? All the so there's so so before people been up in balloons or airplanes, we saw birds and insects and maybe flying squirrels or gliding squirrels. So we had a concept that if you put some energy in, you could you could float. So that looked kind of okay. Birds are kind of weird looking. There, you know. So human beings are often fantasized about it, and then when people realize, okay, you can go lighter than there, you can fly. So okay, that so is in a balloon flying like a bird. Well, it's the definition there is you'll be in gravity, you're able to go up and you have a little bit of control. Now, when the, when the Wright brothers or whoever flew, they were like, they just went a few yards, powered flight, and then fast forward, you know, a hundred or so years. For me, a flight, I, I define flight as, you know, a powered machine where I can get on there are wings, there's a control system, and I can fly, you know, 30,000 feet above and land safely, right? So it's kind of new, uh, loose definition of flight, but for me, um, the, it, I can kind of encapsulate it with some features. Now let's take a step back and say, well, what does, how on earth do we define life? You fall into the same problem as flight. You know, if there's wings, it's not, if there's no wings, it can't fly. Well, Elon Musk manages to fly. <laughs> Right, there's no wings there. They're little bitty things. So what do you? So you then you get stuck. So, what what does flying? Let's not define. Let's not define flight or aeroplanes. What does flight do? Ah, oh, it gets you in the air and you stay there for a bit and hopefully you come down in a nice controlled way. So what does life do? So can we define what life does and not get into all this shenanigans of you know cells doing this? And so I will put it really simply, and I think I have an answer that is not the answer, but yeah, the answer. So life is able to create objects, artifacts, songs, offensive content, whatever you want, um, that can't form randomly in an environment. So that, so what that does is when you see evidence in abundance, so that's it, life can do complex things in abundance. So that means, not one off, right? So if I go, so life can make an iPhone. Here's my iPhone, latest one. Okay, some smart ass physicist would say, oh yeah, that could randomly form. Well, no, it can't. I mean, there's, the chances this randomly form is precisely zero, not very small, just zero. But let's say I go to Mars and I find an iPhone, my grumpy physicist friend say, oh, you just found one. That could be a random event, even though I'm turning it on and I'm calling my mom or something. Um, if I found a thousand identical iPhones with a kind of, with similarity, I know that they have been made by a life form. Okay, and the same goes for a protein or a, a complex enough piece of DNA. So life does complex things the background non-life cannot do, and that is my working not definition but thing that life does. And what I want to do is make something that can do complex stuff um, from scratch. And that's really the acid test, as it were. So because this is the best thing that I can think of to open up your argument a little bit, how would you define that as different than, say, like a cloud that, uh, you know, the, the water forming together creates enough friction to make lightning and thunder and these so other things? Clouds, there's a phenomenon of clouds. I can answer this, but they're not, they're not, the, the, the clouds don't exist. So when I'm talking about object, iPhone, identical I'm not, if you find one, you, if you find me 10 identical clouds, identical down to the, you know, the pattern in the sky and show me them, then I'll, yeah, okay, they're alive, but you won't, right? They are complex um, assemblies 
but they are not living because there is no information that caused them. Same of hurricanes on Jupiter or on Earth, or a flame. There's lots of flames, but they don't have enough features. So, you know, if you see a cloud in the sky that looks like a Monet painting, um, I can tell you lots of Monet paintings, you'll only find the one off and it's association. So, the, so when you see, so the thing is, although the phone is not alive, the phone is not alive, the, ca the causal structure or the sequence of events that produced the phone was alive. A protein is not alive, but the sequence of events that gave a protein is alive. COVID-19, when it's not in your cell, a virus is not alive, but it is produced by evolution. And when it goes into a cell, it is alive. And so what we start to do is this definition says, ah, oh, viruses alive or dead? Wrong question. Were viruses produced by evolution? Yes. Was an iPhone produced by evolution? Sure, because Steve Jobs, annoying as he is to some, hero to others, he was evolved. Same Elon Musk, unless Elon Musk is an alien. We, we could talk about that as well. So, so what I'm saying is that really complex objects that can form in abundance, i.e. identical copies, are the only way to do it is through evolution. And the only thing that we know that can do evolution in a, an autonomous way is life. Wow. You landed the plane on that one. I, I find that to be a very a fascinating concept. And I understand deeply when I heard you talking about it on a movie that you were in or documentary, the challenge of the definition, because life is one of those things that uh, um, philosophers can sit and, and talk abstractly about. And, and if they try and hang in the ordinary way that you define a term with a genus and a species, then, then by virtue of doing that, it puts you down a trajectory where you say the only way to succeed is to already know the answer before we've even started. Yeah. And I had an argument with Stephen Wolfram about this. He's a mathematician who's very smart, but the problem is he knows he's smart. I mean, I'm not smart, but I know I'm not smart. So this is my, this is my superpower. And, and so he was saying, oh, no, I know what life is. So I don't know that you will ever define life because aliens will always look too complicated. I'm like, no, no, no. We will be able to tell aliens and living things in the universe by using this argument and uniquely this argument. And it's because Wolfram and most physicists don't really understand information. It's a really, I'm really saying outrageous things today. Yeah, that is actually heretical. I read a new kind of science. This is this is something that I would imagine he would come through the computer and attack you if you said that they don't understand information. They understand how to manipulate information very well in the human context, but they don't understand how information is invented by the universe. Um, I I think I have a notion of how to do it. And yeah, I think that the the physicists are kind of in their own little bubble in the same way the organic chemists think that they have control over how to make molecules. The physicists and the computer scientists think they understand information. No, they don't. So uh, the way that I got turned on to you was Yosha Bach was out there talking about you. And so before I did this interview, uh, he's somebody that's known to my listeners, somebody I highly respect. I asked him, you know, hey, tell me, you know, what should I expect in this interview with Lee Cronin? And I want to quote this precisely. He said, he dares to be wrong, but he tends to be wrong in interesting and productive ways. And he always seems to ask himself what his theories allow him to build. You think that's a fair assessment? Yeah, I would say so. That's really nice of him. Yeah, I mean, I don't mind being wrong, but the process of me telling you what I'm trying to do allows me to construct a validatory experiment or an invalidatory experiment, and we learn more. It's one of the things I've always learned as a scientist that, um, you know, I grew up, when I was at school, I was in a kind of in the, in the, in the learning difficulties class. And I couldn't ever understand while I was there because, I, you know, I wanted to be smart. And I was, um, it was a great source of... Um, of disappointment when when I kept learning I wasn't so I kept going to the teacher and say well why am I dumb and they were like because you're dumb right and I was like but why and uh, and so so I would say and they say well you can't do this and I was like oh I'll go away and do it I said well am I still dumb and they said well uh, yeah yeah you're still a bit dumb but that's good you know and like so what I would do is I would you know that's the way I do science now is the universe tells me I'm dumb so I do an experiment, I'm like, am I still dumb? And the universe might go, well, that kind of worked. So I think that that, so I think that a lot of people, a lot of scientists say, my secret weapon is I'm happy to be dumb as long as I'm able to come up with new ideas that make me less dumb. And I think that is what science is. That's why hopefully one day I might all be all right, you know, an average scientist or whatever that is. 
Whereas a lot of top scientists are terrified of being wrong. But if you're terrified of being wrong and you're paid because you have to be wrong, then all that happens is you do really boring conservative stuff. Well, that's an interesting thing, particularly because you mentioned Stephen Wolfram earlier. One of my good friends picked up a Stephen Wolfram book from the library. It might have been A New Kind of Science or something else. And inside of it was a handwritten note by a mathematician that said, you should read this book with caution because he Wolfram is um, afraid to put this up to peer review. And because he's afraid of that, then we don't actually know whether or not this is uh, true or not, which which actually brings up an interesting conundrum for you, because you're willing to be wrong and you're uh, you're inside of the 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 weird ivory tower that is academia. And yet you found a way to be wrong in interesting ways, discover new things and still fit in in the system. How is it that you're able to live and thrive in a in the giant bureaucracies that are universities and still discover new things i can ask really profound although i'm really rude i ask really, really profound questions that people like i guess i'm not bored i don't know i guess, i guess academia it's not that academia is full of boring people that's not fair academia so let's go back to stephen wolf from point of, and then so stephen's really interesting like i don't think stephen's it, it, stephen's clearly a very talented person a genius on many levels. I don't think it's my job to call him a genius. Not. I love his work. I love his products. But he's one of those, it's like Craig Venter, Stephen Wolfram and Craig Venter occupy the same kind of niche. They've, they've made themselves money. They've made real products. They understand the real world, but they think they understand something about science and they're frustrated by the inside and the outside. And the problem is that there are a lot of smart people in the world and Stephen Wolfram is not the only genius in the world. There are a few others. So what Stephen Wolfram needs to do is say, hey, what do you think of my idea? And the other genius go, nah, I had that idea five years ago, don't work. What about that one? Oh yeah, that's better. And then you have a dialogue. And so if Stephen Wolfram had submitted himself a bit to that process, not entirely, because he's an outlier, he's a contrarian, we need him. But wouldn't it be great if the system would have been allowed to interact with him to some degree that he would get some feedback and work out when he's wrong and then improve and make it even better. Because Stephen Wolfram is onto something. He's just not, he's not right everything. So what I've tried to do in my science and the way I do is I kind of want to, um, I want to be a contrarian, but I want academia to understand where I'm coming from. So I want to say outrageous things and then I want to prove why I'm right. So out, and then, or why I'm wrong and then move up that scale because that's what excites me. There's plenty of room for more conventional approaches, and there are many of them. There's room for more wild, wilder ones. There's some of those as well. But I think that, um, I mean, I'm, and also the other reason I'm unconventional or able to get away with being unconventional is I'm, I started off life being very conventional in chemistry. I did that on purpose to basically get some credibility. And then as soon as I, as soon as I got credibility, I went, you know, batshit crazy. And openly, not because I've suddenly wanted to, you know, believe in astral projections and, you know, I don't know, faster than light travel and uh, aliens living at the bottom of my garden, because I want to understand the limits of our comprehension of reality and ask questions that people think are outrageous. And when they say that's outrageous, I say, well, why? And then they go, oh, well, because I'm not allowed to ask that. I'm like, well, that's not my problem. You're boring. I'm asking it. So I think what we have to do and what I've tried to do is I use, I guess I'm lucky by, I mean, this sounds odd, right? Because everyone's saying, you know, I'm, I'm a minority, I've been affected in this way. I was in the worst school, in the worst class, in the worst place. There was no way I was getting to university, but I was lucky that I had enough awe of the world to say, well, I think I know how that works. Let me ask the question. And so, and my, you know, one or two teachers took pity on me and allowed me to keep asking the questions. I've been doing the same thing now since I have when I was five, and it seems to work. So that's probably, I mean, I don't know. There's plenty of other people that are really talented people in academia, of course, many smarter people than me. They may be not as, as rude as I am. Yeah, you, you keep reminding me of a concept that I learned from Yoshi Bach about uh, paper walls. So he gave this talk called Computational Metapsychology, which was a fantastic conversation. 
And one of the things he talks about, there are certain people out in the world, probably about 6% of the population, that if you were in a Japanese house and there are paper walls there, most everybody would recognize that the paper walls are there and I'm in the living room and you're in the kitchen and that's fine. But there are some people that they just don't see the paper walls. So they walk right through them and, and you know they end up in somebody's kitchen and you're like, what in the hell are you doing here? But you need those people. Um, and even though they're ordinarily rude to the point of being ostracized from society, oftentimes those people are pushed out because you're like, if you can't understand the social conventions, then you're not allowed here. So the ability to both walk through paper walls and yet still have people want you to come to their dinner parties, that's a very rare gift. Yeah, well, for, still, still for me, I'm not sure I'm wanted at the dinner parties, but one of my good friends in Glasgow is a physicist. Well, I realized he wouldn't invite me anywhere to speak with his friends. And we were pretty good friends. And, he, and then, then he started inviting me. And then he'd introduce me and say, here's Lee. Ignore the first sentence and you'll be fine. Because <laughs> <laughs> in the first sentence, I would just walk through the paper wall. I'd you know, meet as someone who's a, an expert in neutron scattering and say, neutrons are boring. It, scattering doesn't tell me anything. Why are you doing that? And, uh, and, then, and then, hi, how are you doing? And, then, and the person would be so upset. That I would, they wouldn't want to talk to me for the rest of the, of the discussion of the, you know, the dinner or whatever, the conversation. And uh, Miles said, no, no, ignore the first sentence and they pretend you didn't hear it and carry on. And uh, so there's something really weird. Um, no, I mean, clearly there's something very weird about you, but in a great way, it's what makes you a good guest. But there's something that um, I talk about a lot on this podcast, which is. Um, the inner voice of people to, to me, like, even if you can get rid of this idea of consciousness by proving from an MRI that you've made the decision to uh, move your finger before you ever knew that you made that decision and all you're doing is backwards recording what it was that you did. To me, though, the, there is kind of this Jungian idea that curiosity is the spirit or it is the soul. It's the thing that says, Oh, that's captured my attention. And I refer to this oftentimes as the daemon, you know, that, that people have this voice inside of their head that says, go this direction. And as much as you'd like to ignore it, you can't. It appears to me that you are driven deeply by your daemon. But as I describe this, does it become a repellent idea to you that there's some inner creature like a daemon? Uh, no, I mean... <sighs> I mean, I don't make any separation between me, you know, I am me, so I am my conscious brain and my unconscious brain. When I, I mean, I taught myself a version of mathematics when I was four or five, which I didn't really understand was a fairly useful, but I couldn't explain it to anyone. So that's one of the reasons why I ended up in the, in the, in the, in the learning difficulties class, because people said you can't count. I was like, well, no, I just invented a new system. It's much better than that. Why would I do that? And, um, and the problem is that the way I taught myself to do that, I can solve mathematical problems in my subconscious brain faster than my conscious brain. So when the teachers were saying to me, please explain what you did, I'm like, I don't know. I mean, this is like, I don't know. And it's not like I'm not a savant, right? I've got no skills really when it comes to like numbers or anything like that. I just know how to, I think in graphs, I guess. I think in I think in, I don't know, don't, I don't know what it is. I think in some kind of way that gives me insights that occasionally I can distill out to people. Um, and I have no problem with my unconscious brain because the unconscious brain, I mean, I think in some ways, um, I really like talking to Yasha. I mean, he's very, very precise and very, very... Um, I like talking to him because he can take a lot of my unconscious thoughts and the way I think about it and actually puts them into the right order so I understand what I mean, right? So whereas I just have this splurge of I think like reality is like this, but I lack the formal, um, I don't know, education to actually place everything into the right words and the right layering so people understand what I mean. And that can be a big problem. I spend a lot of time drawing pictures. So... I don't think we should worry about our unconscious and subconscious, our, our conscious brains, because they interact with each other in real time and they're continuously updating each other. And so what we should see is our conscious brain is really a, it's actually an inhibitor. It's like don't, your conscious brain is, I say is, it's actually acting against your curiosity, right? So your unconscious brain, but you're being taught social constructs, what you've been taught, what language confines you to do. 
And I am a rebel. If people say, I mean, I wear red trousers and pink shirts and when it wasn't allowed to, now it's boring. <laughs> Paint my, red, my office red or whatever. I walk, to, I walk to work backwards sometimes, right? I, you know, whatever. I like to kind of find novelty in the world because I think that demon you talked about, that curiosity, that is novelty. So what the human brain wants to try and do is minimize its um, surprise. I want to maximize my surprise, but still not die. So, because obviously by minimizing your surprise, you don't get eaten by a predator or run over by a train or whatever. But I still want to, so I try to find ways where I can maximize my surprise. And that gives me enormous satisfaction when I find something new. And I guess that's probably what you're thinking about that, that, that quality that you- a Absolutely, like. that novelty search is, is precisely just the description of what I think is going on there. And recently I, uh, I read a book or a, a paper on the sensorium, I can never pronounce the word, but it was essentially like the theory now that dreams are a way of preventing overfitting and that when you go to sleep, it's uh, if you can if you can get yourself into a place where you have lots of dreams, it's your brain running through all these different um, models that it has and making sure that you aren't saying, hey, I just saw 100 pictures of a brown dog. And when I see a deer, I'm going to confuse that with uh, with a dog and by having these patterns. And the fact that I now have started pursuing this, I can tell you that um, I can figure probably I have about two hours in the morning after I wake up where I can, I can write down things that I figured out at night that I just have to wait until they come to my conscious mind to be able to put them down. Do you have a similar experience? Is this odd to you? Um, I mean, I'm, I don't know. I, I kind of accept all of my unconsciousness and consciousness all at the same time. And I don't sleep that much sometimes. And so when I do get, when I, I, I've been working on a new theory for time which is a chemist i'm like really wind up all the physicists are like you don't understand time and i'm like but but you can't burn you can't burn stuff reversibly and they're like oh and I, i'm gonna get myself so ostracized from the, the these things at this rate but yeah i'm at the moment i'm trying to understand why the universe is deterministic but undetermined and i and i had a dream the other night when i was thinking about myself on a graph and i was that graph and i was bouncing and did it around like a tennis ball down the different branches of the graph and what i've realized is that, um, uh, what am I trying to say? Let's just say I'm in a box and all that box, I've got a couple of balls moving around and it's all deterministic. So I understand what's gonna happen, but let's just say it's kind of complicated. So I really need to calculate what's gonna happen next. It's like, a, it's not obvious, but the problem is because people don't understand time and I, I, I think I have a different perspective. When I build my computer to calculate what's going on in the box, when I've just mastered the box, because suddenly, one unit of time goes by, boom, the box suddenly expands. Now, suddenly that computer that size is not big enough to do that one. And I think I've realized, and this was a dream I had and wrote down, that the way I can understand how the universe is deterministic but undeterminable is that the box is always getting bigger. So when you've just understood what happened, you've only understood the past. And that's why there is a past going to the future. So that means your event horizon goes like this. So you've got all these ideas in the pyramid going out. But and you think you can calculate them and you can capture them, but by the time you've calculated them, another unit of time has gone by and you've just done this. So what does that mean? That means determinism in the universe is fine. Free will is also fine. Well, it's not, it's no such thing as free will, but agency and consciousness and all that jazz. You can't, you, just because the universe is predictable, or sorry, determined, doesn't mean that anything is predictable because the size of the computer that you need to do it is always bigger than the available universe. That was something I came to just two days ago. Brilliant. And and uh, when no, you woke probably up... Probably nonsense, but it's cool. I mean, it, the reason that I think it's brilliant is that it breaks away. I mean, it fits my new hypothesis about overfitting, right? It's, it's that there was a way that you were thinking about the world. And unless I put my brain to sleep where I'm calculating my grocery list and when I have to pick up my daughter and how the work I have to do and stuff for clients then I'm never going to figure those things out. And it ha my brain has to be all the way shut down. And uh, for a long time, I used to try and get there chemically, right? And now I've come to the realization that um, if you do it for me with THC or something like that, you give up night dreams for daydreams. And those daydreams aren't nearly as uh, powerful for overfitting. 
But to me, if I could have dreams like yours, I mean, I would, I would, I would yeah, swap I mean, I, out mine for yours. They I, sound fun. I do feel, I mean, I've never really taken any illegal, well, not illegal, I've never really taken any, I mean, whether it's legal or not, it doesn't matter. I've never taken substances that much, some here and there, but, but, um, and I think that someone said to me, actually, the weird thing about your brain is you don't seem to need to take drugs to hallucinate, to basically be acting like you're on a trip. And I think that's maybe, and that's kind of a nice thing because I think I can do novelty search about the problem about you taking some chemicals is they, they dissolve yourself, right? So you get, you can see the objects, you, the barrier between you and the objects in the universe get lessened. And that's actually really important because you are continuous objects, but then, but, but when, when that happens, you can then have a new perspective on how the universe is and your, your connection to it. Um, whereas I seem to be able to very, very much maintain my sense of self, but basically move myself around all the connections. And that integration of information is different to the other one. But you never, I did dream of once of having a thing called acid con and then invite some academics, say, okay, you just got to drop a tab and then give a lecture. But I think that's illegal. And that's not, that's just my personal opinion. My opinion <laughs> of university <laughs> appears. <laughs> You know, but it would be cool to, you know, when, when it's all been deregulated and we're all happy and we know that we're allowed to, to, to have legal whatever, it would be brilliant to have acid con. So a couple of times in this conversation, you have found ways to be like, I just want to let you know, this is my private opinion. This is not <laughs> the office. But you got yourself in trouble um, by making some jokes. And now having spoken to you for a while, I could see how your jokes could get uh, grabbed and thrown into the world in a way that you never meant for them to. So the way that we encountered each other is that you were apologizing for having um, turned your, well, having a fun turn of phrase with the way you were going to name your lab. Can you describe that? Yeah, it was actually a joke. So I, but my, I, I've got, my lab is called Cronin Lab or Cronin Group after me. And I thought that maybe that's not the, you know, my ego obviously is very important to me in the universe. And it, uh, and I thought, well, my group is doing digital chemistry. It's a big team of people. It's not just about me. I was going to rename the group, right, or have an additional name. It's digital chemistry. And then I spoke to my subgroups because I've got loads of teams and we have all, we, all these different teams. And then one of the teams said, oh, we should name. name. So we do a thing called polyoxymetalates or POMs. And polyoxymetalates are basically like rust. They're like, they're based on tungsten, <laughs> tungsten rust. So it's kind of boring, right? And so one of my group members made a figure, took the thing that this is website, I think it's a Canadian website called Pornhub, which <laughs> is a legal site for pornography. And then, and I think it, it has a white and, a, and an orange thing. And they just gave, they gave the letters P-O-M as in polyoxymetalate hub. And I thought, that's brilliant. <laughs> so all I did, all I did is I screenshotted it and I tweeted it and said, we're going to rename the clusters group to POM hub. And I didn't think anything of it because it's like, and I wasn't even gonna, I was even gonna tweet pornography, <laughs> porn or poms, it's poms every time, right? But I didn't, I just put it like that as a, like a, you know, a wink. So what happened? Um, the, I mean, I tweeted it nine o'clock in the morning. I was in a group meeting. I thought it was hilarious. <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then people started, then North America started to wake up. And, and I think a particular side of North America that wanted, so I, you know, I have a large, well, not a large Twitter following, a reasonable for a chemist, seven, uh, like 13,000 people or something. And then people started to get angry with me and, <laughs> and said, you know, this is terrible. And I was like, it's a joke, dude. Relax. And they were like, no, but what about the, you know, pornography is terrible and all the exploited people and all this stuff. And I was like, oh, look, coal is, coal is legal. But look, think about all the people that have died because of coal mining. But I was like, I'm just not, it's just not going to work, is it? And so I just thought I'd apologize because it was easier. But then when I apologized, then oh man that's gonna make it a me. thousand times worse now you've just like, put blood in the water i just didn't but i don't understand it it's weird because people said so look my view of tweeting uh, my i tweet like i am a human being um i want to make you think and how can i make you think if i can offend you slightly to think so oh offend you intellectually not offend you personally or you know i don't want to offend you make you feel bullied or you know i don't want to make you feel bad about yourself I want you to feel like you're questioning yourself. That's my job, I think. And on Twitter, I made things like that, right? But some people obviously get offended with thinking. 
And so what the, the crew decided is they would take offense at this thing. So I just said, I apologized. And then they kept going and I said, right, actually the way we're gonna stop this now is I'm going to say that if you are really offended and you don't accept my apology, then there's something wrong with my apology. If you're just having a go at me, then you're just bullying me and I'm not gonna accept that. And then it stopped. I was like, okay. Um, and, and then some people said, told me off for apologizing. I said, well, look, just on the off chance, someone was genuinely offended. We, I don't want to do that. But then I realized this is some kind of game on Twitter that I don't understand. Or maybe I should understand because I tweet like I'm speaking to people in a bar. And they said, but you're not in a bar. You're on Twitter. I'm like, it's Twitter. People complained. My department had to talk to me. said, did you do this on university? You know, and I said, no, I did it from my personal <laughs> Twitter account. They were like, okay, cool, cool, cool. It's like, did you say that Glasgow? It's like, no. It's like, <laughs> you know, I was going to tweet pornography, just the word, because it sounds like pornography it would be hilarious, right? But I don't know if I should. I am so glad I asked you, man, because I saw this, I don't know, uh, some t t early in the morning, because I saw Yosha tweeting about it, and I thought, oh, man, oh, this is bad. Oh, oh, man, he apologized. Oh, this is getting real bad. <laughs> But the fact that you really didn't understand and stumbled no, into no that idea. makes it all the funnier uh, to me. And But I think you said something really important there, that uh, you use Twitter to offend people intellectually. The reason I find that uh, to be fascinating is that article that I was mentioning, and I'll put this in the show notes about the sensorium, like why people dream. It made a distinction between entertainment and art. And that um, entertainment is one of those things that doesn't offend you. You already know it. It's, you're, it's fitting into a pattern when you're yeah. watching a comedy or something. But art actually should at times offend you or be difficult for you to understand or even grapple with. So you may encounter art that you love that you simultaneously deeply dislike or disturb you. And uh, that, that to me sounds like a fantastic aim for a Twitter feed, right? That actually will feed into people having better dreams as opposed to the entertainment that comes from, you know, uh, cancel culture, you know, rage mobs. Yeah, I, th I find the whole cancel culture a bit curious because, I mean, you know, I, I mean, I like weirdos. I think the normies should probably start uprising and say, how dare you like weirdos? What about the normies? <laughs> so I'm just like, look. My prefer I, we have to be open with our preferences and challenged on our biases and and we have to ask society what do you want right and then I think when it comes so so I see that people become memes of themselves particularly on Twitter so I did tweet a few months ago like you know hi Twitter how's all that excellent mediocrity out there and I knew the people <laughs> who didn't like that couldn't reply. <laughs> Because that, that is all that <laughs> that is fantastic, you know, and there's nothing that like hurts you more than um somebody saying something that proves that by the way it makes you feel, they are actually correct about what it was that they were saying. Like that is the the ultimate well, catch twenty two that you can capture somewhere. You don't in. want to be correct or incorrect. I don't like you know, I don't feel that I have some some people say that, you know, I need to be more careful what I say because I have I'm well known. I don't think that's the case. That's like saying, okay, people, if you're not well known, you can get away with being a bully and a racist, right? That's fine, young, you don't worry, no one knows you. I feel that I should be me and hopefully I'm not a bully or a racist, right? You know, hopefully. And if people don't like the way I am, they should challenge me and I should either self-reflect and if I'm doing things unprofessional, I should be manned, you know, rem, rem, you know, punished, whatever. But the fact is, I shouldn't change who I am because people, because I have some kind of status or standing. I should achieve that status or standing because of who I am. I think that's, I thought that's how it worked. But there are obviously a lot of pretend people out there who are basically, there's lots of people saying what they want. So Twitter is now this dopamine hit. So that's why I want to make a new Twitter. So I can work out, I've got this idea of making time travel Twitter where I can work out how to integrate all the information across Twitter, work out what the trend is going to be three months from now and hack that beforehand and then sell it to people. I say, yeah, I know how to get hacked because basically most of you are boring and I can know how to hack your dopamine and you're also boring that I can just basically bait you on Twitter and make money out of it. Well, so here, here in lies, you know what? You could do it as NFTs and you could sell them in advance and let people there buy low and sell go. high. 
Yeah, yeah. And then, then maybe by doing this, of course, people aren't boring. I like being boring occasionally. I, I wear the same pink trousers and the same pink shirt. It's, I'm wearing my running gear just now, actually, um, uh, every day because I want to be boring in some things. So I've got cognitive capacity to be novel. And I think we're all like that. And we choose where to be boring or novel. And so um, if we can convince people maybe not to be so boring, then the world may be more interesting. And maybe we shouldn't take ourselves so seriously, but at the same time, correct where things are clearly bad. You know, I want to have a fairly open mind when I'm um, people in my research group. I don't want to be a racist. I don't want to be a bully. I don't want to be um, closed minded. And I know I'm a racist, bully, closed minded person to some degree, like everyone is. Anyone who says I'm not a racist, I'm not a bully, I'm not closed minded doesn't know how what these things are. But I'm aware that I have effects on people and I want to be positive with those people and I want people to do good jobs and feel good about themselves. So I need to challenge myself as much as, you know, I challenge other people. And it's a two way. So I think by being honest and transparent and wrong, there's, there's hope, right, for humanity. That's what I need to do. If people cancel me because of it, okay. I mean, you know, then all you're going to do is you're going to get into this future where everybody is like pretending to be perfect. It's like, it like reminds me, I don't know if you know, Black, uh, is it Black Mirror, the episode of Black Mirror called Nosedive. I love that episode where everyone's obviously really suppressed, but they're not allowed to be bad to each other or to fall out because they get marked down on their and I can see that as a potential future. But anyway, we digress a lot. But yeah. So, you, I, I, you know, I, you talk about not liking boring things or boring people. You've talked about like your friends warn other friends that you might say something, you know, the first few phrases out of your mouth are going to be kind of offensive. What is your social life like? Are you, do you have a rich ability to, to have um, deep interconnections with lots of other people? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, I am, I, I'm interested. Look, I'm interested in people who are interested in stuff. And I'm interested in helping people who want help to do interesting stuff. And so what I've been able to do, I suppose, in my life is make lots of connections around the world, um, you know, all around the world in, who think about different things. And we're connected by the fact that we are maybe contrarians on our own disciplines. Um, so I know lots of people from computer science, from molecular biology, from politics, though lots of artists, and we tend to, and we like the fact that we confuse each other and provoke each other. And I have friends, of course, who, you know, who are, who like cycling and running and stuff. I mean, I'm not like, you know, saying, oh, that everyone is boring and I hate all normality. What I want to do is I find a pleasure in novelty and stimulation in asking questions that I don't know the answer to. And that's why I like being an academic. And so, and, and that tends to be also something I do in my life. I, I, you know, in my in my downtime, I'm asking questions about asking questions. You know, so it's my hobbies are a bit like my day job. They kind of go together. But I'm not allowed to say that, am I? I'm supposed to have a proper, you know, I'm supposed to have, you know, only work 38 hours a week or whatever, and not dream about science and not do it 24/7. But that would be a lie. I do it 24/7. But I'd like to have fun doing it, and it's not just all the same thing. There's lots of different things I'm trying to do with lots of different people, and some of that is really good fun because we do it socially. You know, we're doing some stuff on Clubhouse now with some friends to talk about the origin of life and the origin of evolution and. Why, why is the universe what it is? Because I want to have discussions with people that aren't just in academia, who have interesting questions. And I think that that's something I, I'm finding more and more interesting. And the disappointment with Twitter is that people just weaponize it to get, you know, up lists. Once I recognize that, then I could, you know, take my naivety, because I'm quite naive in these things out of it, right? You know, I got told off for not knowing what wokeism is. And I'm like, well, what do you mean? Oh, you mean, oh, okay, understanding that you're prejudiced? Yeah, sure. I've understood that since I was like nine years old, thanks. My, my, third, my Christian name is Leroy, and I grew up in the southeast of England when fame, the only other Leroy in the world was, you know, the guy wearing the leg warmers in fame. And, uh, you know, 
It was, this is anyway. a cultural joke. I have no concept oh, of what a, you're talking about. <laughs> the guy was a color uh, African American, um, a, a subject to racism and all sorts of things. And there were no other Leroy's in my school except me. And I got <laughs> I got beaten up on. You know, I'm not saying that I understand racism. I just understand being bullied as a result of a of a point of difference. But that was a long time ago. So, um. Where do you think that your science will go 10, 15, 20 years from now in, in the space that most people are not willing or able to plan or predict? Where do you think you're going? It's hard to answer that question because, you know, I, I can remember, I remember being told off by a senior professor about a TED talk I gave. I was lucky enough to give a TED talk, like, you know, TED Global on the Red Circle. Oh, the real TED, not, not yeah, like yeah, the yeah, TEDx. TED, real TED. I'm going to have to go minutes. look that up. Okay, I'll link that I in the show I think it was 2011 notes. in Edinburgh. What did you say? The, the first, I was the first speaker of the entire conference. So, and, you know, and um, and I talk, gave it on inorganic life. And I, I wanted to make, a, you know, biology and so on. And then Chris Anderson at the end says, it's so Lee, when do you think you're going to do it? And I said, oh, you know, it'll be about three years. He's like, three years? I said, but after I've worked out how to do the experiment, it shouldn't take more than three years. But that's misquoted at me time and time again. So I got told off by some old senior professor a few weeks ago, you said on TED you were going to do it in three years, and that was in 2011. Look how rubbish you are. You spent all this money and all of the, and you've done nothing interesting. And I was like, thanks, man. That's so nice. You know, training like, you know, hundreds of people, ha having 70 PhD students come through my team, my group, you know, that's nothing, right? They don't count. And it was really odd. Um, but I'm sidestepping the question. No, look, in 10 years' time, there will be robots doing chemistry in pretty much every lab of the world. I'm going to make it happen. And if I, if I have to go and, you know, beat down Elon Musk's door myself and say, look, I'm not, I mean, I'm nothing compared to you, but I know how to do chemistry. Help me, you know, or the equivalent. I will make sure that happens. Why? Because I can make chemistry safe. I can make it reproducible. I can stop people having, you know, imagine doing a de college degree and then, doing a PhD and for the, and then doing a postdoc and for the PhD that's three years and maybe the postdoc after your PhD for another two or three years, having to do manual labor in a laboratory that's just repetitive time and time again, you know, I can remove that in a stroke now, I think. So that's one of the missions I've got. And that requires, I also need to change the way people are taught chemistry. So I'm going to make it, I'm going to go on the record now. Where are we? You know, 2021 and towards the end of March by 2032, um, there will be the human beings will seldom be doing um, chemistry in the lab that's they could do with a robot. So you know, reproducible chemistry. Let's make it happen. Lee Cronin, man, I I I love this conversation, and so I have a question that I ask people, but I don't ask everybody because it puts them on the spot, and it's kind of difficult. But okay. you, I think, are prepared for this. It's called my Peter Thiel paradox. So the Peter Thiel paradox is what is one thing that you believe is true that almost no one you know agrees with you on? I don't think this is going to be hard for you, but for a lot of people, it's difficult because if you say something that isn't that no one agrees with you on, um, if you if you say something people agree with, you've already failed. But then if you say something people don't agree with you on, now you've got to talk your way out of it. What is something that you think from Yosha Bach all the way through all your artist friends, you could say that they would not agree with you on? All right. Yeah, there's one thing. I think I'm right, is that time exists and it creates space. And that the reason why we don't understand these, this, the second law of thermodynamics and, and the order in the universe and, and why I think disorder works now and determinism is because time is more fundamental than space. And when you then put that in your head and you think about it, it changes the way the universe works in a remarkable way. It changes the way that we have to view physics because physics is not the physicist no longer the the monarch in the universe time is the monarch and so time is really weird from that point of view but i think almost everybody would you know people would because they're used to me coming up with coming out with outrageous statements most people would pat me on the shoulder and say yeah 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 lee you'll break out of it soon but no i'm pretty sure that everybody's understanding of time as currently conceived as wrong, but I'm not talking about some wacky thing. I'm just saying, hey, imagine the time. I've got it written actually on my board in here. Let me get it, it's hidden. Uh, where have I got it? Maybe I've taken it down. Oh, here we go. It's almost as if I knew you were gonna ask the question. Go 
Great. Yeah. So oh, you're holding, hold on. Hey, let me read it. Yeah. Yeah. Read it. Yeah, for you, the people that are listening. Physicists are wrong about time. Time came first, and it's a particle of mass. Now, I'm not sure about the last two bits, but for, I, I'm sure about the first two. Physicists are wrong about time. Time came first. I think it might be a particle of mass. And why did you write that down and put it up on a, on a board? Um, because, um, because I was asked to come up with a controversial statement a, week, a few weeks ago, and, I, and, I, and I, I came up with a boring one. And I came up with this one and I did, was too scared to say this one. So I wrote it out and put it on for a day like this. And it was like two weeks ago. So, <laughs> Oh, nothing could make me happier than that. I mean, that's, I think the, the way that people get out of their gravity well, you know, of the, of, of the same voices that they hear is to, is to always be asking yourself, do I have something that I believe is true that nobody else agrees with? Because that means you're at least getting um, novelty from somewhere that, that your entire gravity well isn't already getting. So I think it's awesome that you have one and that you would, you had already written it down. <laughs> Lee, I could talk with you for hours. I hope that you will come back on. This has been absolutely fantastic. If there were people out there that heard what you were saying and they said, that is a reality I would love to see happen. Um, and they want to help your lab go further, faster. What could people do to help you? Uh, contact me, give me advice. Um, help me with technology, um, I suppose. I think that's the main thing I'm trying to do is to get as many like minds together to make this work. Getting people to do chemistry, robotics, and artificial intelligence in the same lab is actually quite hard. Lots of people doing AI, and they think they can read about chemistry, but practical chemistry, practical robotics, and, and, pr and practical AI, that intersection is really small. It's going to expand. And what I'm going to need to do is get money and technology and vision, other people vision around that. So, yeah. So, so I, have any I, of those I have a thought on that. And that is that the plant biology world exploded for a while, right? They were doing genetics. They had turned it all into robotics. You could do massive field trials and just a little tiny mm -hmm. um, like microchip. And so much of the innovation has stopped in plant biology. The big ag companies went from six to four. And yep. uh, now there's all these people that have brilliant minds, have worked on incredibly complex problems, and there's no show in town that lets them really push the envelope. So if I were you, I'd go pick off the plant biologists and the geneticists. I well, should say that well, the next add-on to the chemical robot is I think I know how to program biology using my chemical computing language to go up a level. And one of the things we're doing right now is I'm adding a uh, bioreactor to do fermenting in the computer so we can basically dial in a gene, make the molecule we want, take it out, put it in the chemical robot and go back. Wouldn't it be great to basically get a plant or a bacteria to make a molecule, take that molecule, put it in the chemical robot, chemical robot does something to it. And then you put that molecule in a plant. So you go bacteria, chemical robot, plant, you should 100% look up the company that is uh, in part run by my good friend, Eric Ward, called Ag Biome. I think you'll find that is a okay. very interesting place. So, right. Lee, thank you so much for joining me, and I will have you back on. Okay, very nice to have a discussion. It's been a lot of fun.